Hi, this is Ben Westhoff. I'm calling in for the Detroit cast. Hey, Ben, how you doing? It's Mike and Jay from the Detroit cast. Hey, Ben. Uh, great. How are you guys doing? Very well. We're doing good, man. We've really enjoyed your book, Original Gangsters, The Untold Story of Dr. Dre, Easy e Ice Cube, Tupac, and the Birth of West Coast Rap. How's it doing? Oh, it's, it's doing great. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's great. I just learned the rights were have been sold in German and Japanese, so got the, the Axis Powers alignment. <laughs> oh, nice. What does that do to a book if you have to reissue it in Japanese? Does it change the, the feel of the book at all? That's a really good question. I have no idea, but I can't imagine it wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an it's an interesting read, kind of all about the the birth of gangster rap and the East Coast West Coast battles, the start of NWA, and we can get into a lot about that. But were you just a fan who decided to to write this book, or or how did that come about? Yeah, in high school, this music was really popular in Minnesota, of all places where I was growing up. Albums like Doctor Dre's The Chronic and Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style were the biggest things in my high school. And then when I became LA Weekly's music editor a few years ago, I got the chance to interview all my childhood idols, people like Dr. Dre and Ice-T and Ice Cube and Snoop Dogg. And so the book kind of took off from there. Yeah, I was going to ask you how much access you had to a lot of those guys. Were you able to track down, well, the ones that are still alive anyways, a lot of them? Yeah, definitely. I was able to interview and talk to all the surviving NWA members and a bunch of the, you know, peripheral peripheral players as well, people who knew Tupac well. So, so yeah, I was able to, thankfully. Were you able to get with Jerry Heller before his death? I was, yeah. I had a very interesting experience with him. He led me into the private community where he lives in Calabasas, California, right next door, just two houses down from Easy e and I said I wanted to see EZ's house. He let me see it. But then when I tried to interview Jerry himself, he got really cantankerous. And, um, you know, we had a, a, a fun little encounter. But um, he was known for kind of having a prickly personality. So I definitely got to see that. Yeah, and of course, he was the former manager of NWA and was accused by several of the guys of, of cheating him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, people that I interviewed for original gangsters were kind of like split right down the middle down the middle on Jerry. There's no doubt that without him, he was a music industry veteran. He was a white guy who was, you know, like 20 years old or 30 years older that they NWA might not have blown up how they did. He really had the context to make it happen. But at the same time, a lot of people think that there were some shady business negotiations when it came to people like Dr. Dre and Ice Cube's contracts. Yeah. What, what do you think in the end? Do you think Jerry Heller was a good guy? I, 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 I kind of got the impression that Easy always had Jerry's back, but the other guys really didn't like him. In, in but the you end, wonder why Easy had his back so much. You yeah, know? totally. Yeah. Well, I actually investigated this for my book and I didn't find any evidence that Jerry stole money from anyone. Now, I think most likely what happened is that he presented the guys with bad contracts. They <laughs> didn't read it too closely. They didn't hire a lawyer and they just signed. And so, you know, is that a little shady? Yes, probably. But that's, but that's the music business. In the music industry. Yeah, that's gone on forever to, and continues to this day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, how did how did Jerry Heller and because Easy E and Jerry Heller started Ruthless Records together, which was their bond? How did those two end up? It seems like a weird marriage. You know, this this older white yeah, Jewish guy. Yeah, it was and, and, a relationship. It was it was kind of like father and son. Father and son in some ways. A lot of people said Easy was well. First of all, he was a crack cocaine dealer in Compton who wanted to go straight. And so he took his profits from dealing drugs and invested them in this label. And he heard that Jerry was the best. And, you know, never mind that Jerry didn't know anything about gangster rap. He <laughs> wanted to, he knew that Jerry could help them get to the next level. And they became really, really tight, even at a time when everyone else was like, what are you doing with this guy? Easy defended him. And he bought a pair of white BMWs. And the one Easy had for himself said, Ruthless one on the license plate, and the one he got for Jerry Heller said Ruthless two. So that kind of shows you their bond. Yeah, yeah. Where did they come up with the name Ruthless Records? I thought that was interesting. 
Yeah, it was actually an affiliate called uh, uh, from a group called Yolo and Malky who saw an ad for the Danny DeVito movie Ruthless People, <laughs> and he thought that would be a good name for the label. So it's kind of an odd story. Yeah. Um, so you know the the story with with Easy E is always fascinating, and it kind of gets glossed over his his early life. You know, he here here he is this drug dealer, like you said. Well, I, I love how you talk about how he came upon this drug dealing profession is sort of a windfall, right? Where, where his cousin yeah, kind of got him involved and he, gave him a buttload of product. Yeah. He was working with his cousin who was murdered. And right before his cousin's death, he showed easy where he kept his big stash of drugs. And so then after his cousin's death, easy went back to see the stash and his surprise, there was not only drugs, but like, tens of thousands of dollars in cash and like rubber band rubber banded up and so that was sort of the seed money he took for his operation right off the bat but but he always kind of had a business mind i mean i I thought it was funny that he always kept like two thousand dollars cash in his sock at all times but he, he didn't partake he didn't drink he didn't do drugs he was just kind of a dealer early on right yeah and he thought that kind of gave him a mental advantage he knew that he had to stay sharp. It was, uh, you know, at this time in Los Angeles and Compton in the mid eighties, the murder rate was at historic levels. There was gang violence. The, the Crips and the Bloods had carved up every inch of Compton and easy was a member of the Crips, but he wasn't really about doing drive-bys or, you know, really nefarious gang behavior. He was more about his money and that's sort of what he cared about the most. Yeah. But, but he, so so was Easy into rapping back then? I know like Dr. Dre and, and Yella and MC Ren, those guys were, were working on this. I always kind of thought Easy was brought into the mix just because he had money, but was he trying to be a rapper before NWA started? No, he was scared of rapping, actually. When Dr. Dre had this great song that he wanted to produce called Boys in the Hood, the group that he wanted to do it backed out. And so Dr. Dre, you know, he's really a a musical genius when it comes to knowing who might be able to bring a certain sound to a record. And so he said, you know, Easy, you've got you've got the image, you've got this this crazy squeaky voice that sounds kind of terrifying. You should give it a try. And and Easy went into the booth, and you know, it took him like all day to, to to rap one song. But Dr. Dre was right; he really did have a, a good voice for it. Yeah, it's it's a remarkable voice. Yeah, more it's, one of the most unique ones that you'll hear on that record, and it's yeah. sort of what you remember when you think about NWA. At least I do. Yeah, I I, I totally yeah agree that. definitely. Hey, so, you mentioned Dre and his skills and his identif- ability to identify talent and obviously produce music. But who do, who would you say is um, was most vital to the development of NWA and this gangster rap genre that that grew up out of it? Was it Cube or Dre? That's a good question. I might have to give it to to Dre just because the sound, ultimately the beats, I think, are what sold the records. And at the same time, it was Ice Cube's message on songs like F the Police and Straight Outta Compton. He was the one who sort of fashioned their anti-establishment, anti-police brutality, kind of pro-black message at a time when, when Dre and, and Easy didn't really want to do that at all. They weren't into being political, but it's, it's those themes that resonated with people. But I think even if you've got amazing lyrics and, and amazing rapping, I think if you don't have that beat that really sticks with people, you're not going to stick around, and, and ultimately that's what Dre provided. Well, Fuck the Police, obviously they're probably their most known song. Um, what is the story? I know they touch on it in, in the movie Straight Outta Compton, but what was the origin of, of that song? Yeah, that's a funny story I found out while really digging deep into my reporting for Original Gangsters is that, first of all, Dr. Dre, when he heard the idea for the song from Ice Cube, he was on probation himself. He actually was on weekend lockup. He had to go back and forth to jail and so he didn't really want to antagonize the police anymore at this point so he said let's put that on hold um and then there was an incident later where the guys were driving around the harbor freeway in la and they had just been paintballing apparently and they were sticking their paintball guns out the window and 
you know, pretending to shoot at people. And they got pulled over for that. The cops did not think that was too cool, and they splayed him down on the ground. This was according to the NWA affiliate, Alonzo Williams, who's also in the movie. And they, the police really gave them the business. And according to Alonzo, that is the incident that inspired Fuck the Police. Yeah. And so so what did they, he just went into the studio after that? And, and was that a quick, uh, was it easy for him to pen that song after an incident like that? Or was it more, you know, leaning back on incidents they'd all had growing up with the police that kind of played a part? Yeah, I think so. I think Ice Cube had witnessed a lot of police harassment. And I think all the guys had. I think it was basically impossible to grow up in South Central and Compton and L.A. and be a young black man and not... Um, know about the, the police harassing people unjustly, you know, and that's something that still is happening, obviously, today in America. And I think that's why Fuck the Police is still being played at uh, rallies, you know, like for the Michael Brown protests in Ferguson and mm-hmm. everywhere from Baltimore to Baton Rouge. You you still hear that song today. Yeah. And and I, I thought I read in your book that Dre's not really a huge fan of that, the album, Straight Outta Compton. Is that true? He thinks that his skills as a producer hadn't really come up to speed yet. And I I disagree. And a a lot of people do, obviously it's a classic album, but if you listen to it now, you can hear that it's heavily influenced by public enemy and the kind of chopped up samples. And it's not what you would call the definitive Dr. Dre sound. And I think he would start developing that more on his first solo album, the chronic. So Mm. I think it's just a case more where he's a perfectionist. Uh, and so he doesn't like his early stuff. Yeah, and, and those guys were, in, it was a weird time in music then. That was kind of when the uh, the labels were being put on albums. The FBI got on them, which probably helped their career more than anything. But but fuck the police. What was the story behind uh, Joe Louis Arena, which is where uh, an incident happened and they were told not to perform that song? Yeah, they agreed with the police beforehand not to perform that song in Detroit but and there was a huge police presence spread out throughout the arena but the according to Ice Cube the uh, the audience members started chanting and demanding the song and so they decided to play it anyway and then immediately when they burst into the song someone let off some firecrackers and it's not really clear who it might have been an audience member it might have been the police but people thought it was gunshots, and there was just total chaos, and the police ran after the group, and they, you know, in the movie, it says that the police arrested them and threw them in the paddy wagon, and that did not happen. No. But the group sort of just went back to their hotel, and the police um, gave them a talking to, and that's really the end of it. Yeah, so, so it wasn't quite as hyped up as it was in the movie then, is what you're saying. Yeah, that was a big part of my book, Original Gangsters, was kind of separating the, the fact from the myth. And the the movie, Straight Outta Compton, it's good, I like the movie, but the producers were Ice Cube, Dr. Dre, and Evie's Widow, so they were kind of invested in making them look cool at at the expense of the actual facts often. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the other guys that, that is prominent in your book is is D.O.C., and he was kind of a, an honorary member of NWA. And, and God, what a tragic story. His, his uh, you know, kind of career getting cut short. Um, also, he was the link to Suge Knight, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, DOC was kind of this wonderkin out of Dallas who came to L.A. on, on Dr. J's behest and was sort of like you said, the sixth unofficial member of NWA and was a ghostwriter. He wrote a lot of Easy es lyrics. And then he had a solo album of his own that was amazing. It's still amazing today called No One Could Do It Better. And he got in this horrible car wreck. He was drinking too much, smoking too much weed. He fell asleep at the wheel and um, scar- ended up scarring his larynx in the accident. And so he couldn't really rap anymore. God, of all injuries. I, 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 I know of End all. End up with a scarred larynx. Larynx. Of uh, all damn it. In, yeah, you can lose a leg and still be a rapper, but the larynx, it's the one injury you can't sustain. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and the story with Suge Knight is interesting, too, because Suge was really a nobody in the music industry. He was kind of a bodyguard, and he kind of glommed on 
to DOC, and then he once he got you know more embedded with Ruthless Records, which DOC was a part of, he learned that Dr. Dre was unhappy with his contract and that he thought he should be getting paid more. So Suge kind of did a divide and conquer thing, and eventually ended up intimidating, attempting to intimidate Eazy E, the owner of the label, and and said that Dr. Dre wasn't getting paid what he was worth, and that led to Dre leaving the label with Suge to start Death Row Records. Mm-hmm. And and Suge over the years has been accused. I mean, obviously he's in jail for for on murder charges as we speak, but. He's been accused of embezzlement, extortion, beating people for the most minor of slights. H- how much truth is there to the Suge Knight story? And because there's also a lot of people that say he did a lot of good for inner city communities and charities. Um, what what is the story with with that guy? Yeah, I think most everything you've heard, there's at least a grain of truth to it, whether the good and the bad. There, there's no doubt that Suge. Had, he had three things at his disposal. He had he had physical intimidation. He was a big guy, and he wasn't afraid to push people around and knock their teeth around. And he also had, like, the hottest label in music, practically, Death Row Records. And everyone wanted to be a part of it, and he could sort of – he had a lot of money to throw around. And he also had deep contacts with the LAPD, and there were uh, members of the police force and the Compton police force who did security, moonlighting for death row. And he was also in with the DA. The, the, this assistant DA was stripped of his um, his bar license, I believe, because he he made this deal with Suge where Suge gave the assistant DA's daughter a record deal and uh, rented, agreed to rent his house for like $19,000 a month. So there was all sorts of conflicts of interest going on. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's an amazing um, story with, with Suge Knight. I, I don't know if, if there's what we know is true or what you hear from some of your contacts about what happened. I, I think it was on the set, actually, of Straight Outta Compton, the movie, where he's accused of running over the guy with his truck or a couple guys um, and facing murder charges. Um, what, what's the story you've heard behind that? Yeah, I've talked to people that were right there at the scene, and, you know, Suge has accumulated a lot of bad karma over the years, and so it's maybe not surprising he's in jail on this murder trial, but people seem to think that he's actually telling the truth when he says that it was an accident that he ran over this guy and killed him. The guy he, he killed was actually his friend, and he he had come down to this burger stand in Compton, and someone attacked him, in his car window and he was sort of peeling out to try to get away from this guy. That's what he says. And that's what some people seem to believe. So we'll, we'll see what, what happens in court. Mm -hmm. Well, your book goes way beyond NWA and it branches out as, as you're alluding to with Suge and and the development of uh, death row. And then obviously the East coast, West coast conflict Um, in a nutshell. And I know this is, (laughs) yeah, good luck. (laughs) Yeah, this is this is the, the big the big uh, million dollar question here. But what happened with the whole Tupac issue and the notorious B.I.G. and uh, Puffy's involvement, Suge's involvement, and so forth? What's your take on that? Given your interviews, and you've interviewed hundreds of people uh, for this book, it's a hugely researched book. So, um, what's your take on that whole whole situation? Yeah, well, a lot of people don't know that Tupac and Biggie were very close friends and Biggie at first and Biggie considered Tupac a mentor and, uh, and they, they got along great. That all changed after Tupac was shot non-fatally the first time in 1994 when he was in New York and he survived the shooting, but he became convinced that Biggie knew he was going to be set up, that Biggie knew he was going to be shot. And this really bothered him because they were so close. And so Tupac began talking to Suge Knight and convinced him that they should go to war with Biggie and his label, which is called Bad Boy and was headed by Puff Daddy. And um, that was sort of the seeds of what became known as the East Coast, West Coast War. And that began to spiral out of control and eventually... According to the, you know, the the murders are both unsolved, but according to an LAPD detective named Greg Kading, who's really looked deeply into these cases 
and whose um, research I really I really believe, it seems likely that Suge Knight paid someone to kill Biggie, and it, it's also possible that Puff Daddy paid someone to kill Tupac, although the, the man who was involved with that shooting is, it's kind of his words against Puffy's, and Puffy, of course, denies it, so... Well, it seems amazing that you can have, you know, because that was after Tupac getting murdered on the Vegas Strip after a Tyson fight. It just seems amazing that that you would have that many. It's such a public spot, that many witnesses, and they've never found the the killer for that. It just seems why why is it? Where did that that case stall? Yeah, it's definitely unbelievable. And as some people have said, you know, if these were big white stars like Frank Sinatra being murdered or something, you can bet we would have somebody in prison. But the the you know, the the word that people say is that people know who did it, but a lot of people weren't willing to talk. So it was a combination of this sort of like no snitching philosophy along with some real ineptitude on the part of the Las Vegas police. And the, the most likely killer is this guy named Orlando Anderson, and he was a Compton Crip who happened to be in Las Vegas. And right after the Tyson fight, Tupac and Suge and some other guys from Death Row ran into this guy, Orlando, and beat the crap out of him, basically, right there in the MGM Grand Casino. And yeah, there's video of that. Caught on video camera, yeah. you know, every, it was all in the open. And then later that night... According to the the most believable theory, um, Orlando Anderson got retribution basically and and killed and killed Tupac and but but this is complicated because Orlando Anderson is dead himself now, so we might never have closure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where does the uh, East Coast West Coast you know war stand today? Is there anything still simmering under the surface? Didn't Louis Farrakhan help smooth all that out? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think the, those tensions have been pretty well tamped down. Um, as, as you mentioned, after Biggie's murder, after Tupac's murder, there was real fear in hip hop. There was some people were afraid that the genre itself might not survive because of these high-profile murders. I mean, Tupac and Biggie were the biggest stars in all of hip hop, and they were murdered within just six months of each other. But there was actually a big peace summit held in Chicago organized by Louis Farrakhan, who was a friend to rappers on both coasts. And the, the Nation of Islam had served as security for a lot of, a lot of these rappers, and, and there was a, a tight bond. And so he invited people from, from Death Row, from Ruthless, people like Snoop Dogg and Ice Cube from the West, and he invited a bunch of people from the East Coast, too, and even from the South. And this was in 1997. It happened really under the radar, this peace treaty, that everybody got in a room. Nobody, you know, got mad at each other. They ironed out their differences. And a lot of people credit that summit with really saving hip-hop. Oh, it is a religion of peace after all. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, Easy es death has been talked about for years. There's been rumors, um, you know. Easy, of course, dying of AIDS, but it was kind of crazy the way that went down. It was like he was an announced HIV positive, had AIDS within days, and then was dead. Um, what What do you think is the story behind Easy E with AIDS? They do they even know officially where he got it? Yeah, these were all questions that I really investigated deeply in my book, Original Gangsters, and. The, the reason people don't think Easy actually had AIDS was because, like you said, A, he got it so fast and was dead so fast, but B, that his uh, children would never announce that they had it. His, the mothers of his children never said that they had it. So there's, as far as we know, nobody had it. But the doctors that I talked to said that that's actually not that unlikely, that for one thing, you can be HIV positive for years and not even know you know, you might not have any symptoms. It's quite possible that easy. It just seemed like it all came on fast. And these were the dark days of HIV AIDS uh, medicine. And there was really almost nothing to, to really to keep him alive. There, there, there were some, some drugs that prolonged people's lives, but he didn't start taking them, in, you know, basically until it was too late. Mm -hmm. so. Well, his girlfriend had the wherewithal to marry him. 
right before yeah. class. So. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't Huge it? Market. Yeah, and that's that's something else that I get into. His his a lot of people. This is another area where there are a lot of conspiracy theories. His girlfriend was named Tamika Woods, and he out of nowhere, you know, he had a lot of women. He had he had a lot of yeah. Uh, there was no shortage of women competing for his affection, and so everybody was like, "Wait a minute, why all of a sudden he's about to die? Is he marrying?" this woman and the people have accused her of speeding up his murder of like changing his will without his knowledge and all sorts of things. But, um, in her defense, she was working for Motown records at the time. So she had, she had business sense. She knew the music industry. And so it seems likely that easy married her on his deathbed because he thought she could take over his company and make ruthless records, you know, keep it keep it alive, keep it strong. Yeah. How are they doing now? I mean, is his family well taken care of? I imagine they're still making money off of uh, NWA's work and Easy es solo work. There's a lot of tension in that family, and most of it comes between Tamika, Easy's widow, and Easy's children. And they have complained to me that they haven't been receiving proceeds from things like the Straight Outta Compton movie last year and uh, the NWA music, which is still really popular, and Tamika owns all the rights to it, and Easy's children complain that she hasn't spread the wealth around. Makes for a tense Christmas dinner at the Wright household. I, I, I would... <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there was also... Wasn't there a robbery right after Easy es death, and, and a lot of master reels were stolen? Is it possible that, that have never been recovered... And that that there's a lot of unreleased Easy E music out there. Yeah, it's definitely possible that there's unreleased, never heard Easy E music out there. It was around the time of Easy E's death. There were all sorts of crazy things going on. There were all these different factions fighting for power. Like Jerry Heller, he was abruptly fired by Easy E not long before his death. But but Jerry thought that he was the rightful heir to the to the ruthless legacy. To, to the company, and then there was this mysterious Israeli guy who'd come in as security for Death Row, and he was saying that he was the, excuse me, for Ruthless, and this, this mysterious Israeli security guy said that he was the rightful owner of, of Ruthless after Easy died, and then Tamika had her own claim, and there were, um, you know, in the meantime, in the midst of all this chaos, someone stole some of Easy's music, someone, um, and they took it to Canada, and they tried to establish their own little ruthless office in Canada that nobody else knew about. So it's just, it's, it was so crazy what was happening. Any truth to the rumor that Easy collaborated with Guns N' Roses and that that track might be on some of this uh, hidden, uh, hidden recordings? Yeah, I believe he did uh, do a track with Guns N' Roses, but I don't think it ever got to any sort of like um, stage where it was ready for public consumption. So I have no idea what would have happened to that. Um, just a couple minutes left, uh, Ben, and thank you for the time. Original Gangsters, it's, it's, a, it's a great book. Um, but I'm also interested, you know, when Dre left Suge Knight and Death Row Records, he starts Aftermath, uh, which obviously is, is legendary now. But at the time, it kind of got a slow start, and, and a lot of people think uh, him finding a young Marshall Mathers really helped uh, boost that, too. How, how did that come about? How did he get, um, you know, how did he come to find Marshall? Well, Dr. Dre, at the height of Death Row's power, you know, he was worth like $100 million or more. He was sick of Suge Knight's gangbanging uh, friends. He wasn't able to make music. There was too much chaos. And so he just left. He didn't take any money. He left. He started his own label called Aftermath with Jimmy Iovine, who was a, a music producer turned mogul. And... They and Jimmy was just sort of randomly sent this tape from this white rapper in Detroit named Marshall Mathers, and he thought, you know, this might be pretty good. And Dr. Dre took one listen to it, and he said, you know, I've got to meet this guy. I've got to, I've got to find this guy. And sort of the rest is history. Um, Eminem became the best-selling rapper of all time, you know, and one of the biggest pop stars too. Mm-hmm. And he really helped Dr. Dre get Aftermath Records on the map and sort of sealed both of their destinies. Yeah, I, I wonder if there was any hesitation on Dre's part. I mean, being a white rapper back then was certainly not cool. 
Um, yeah, vanilla ice did not help things. Yeah, yeah. Was, <laughs> do you think there was any hesitation, or was the talent just so obvious that it was like, I don't care what color this kid is? Yeah, I think that, again, goes back to the genius of Dr. Dre. He knows a sound, winning sound when he hears it. And I think, if anything, he might have thought that uh, he had the vision to know that Eminem because he was white would help uh, expand hip hop to, to new audiences. And he was ultimately proven right. Mm -hmm. Well, in the end, how do you, how do you think the, the guys in NWA, especially, you know, go down in history? Are they, um, I mean, they're in the rock and roll hall of fame now. That's obviously impressive, but how do you think they're, they'll be remembered through time? I think that they kicked off the whole gangster rap movement and, and gangster rap is still, what basically dominates hip hop today, the stuff that's the, the new, the new rap that you hear, that's kind of with these hard edge themes that talks about violence and drugs and things like that. They don't really call it gangster rap these days, but it's that same spirit that EZE and NWA kicked off. They basically made it okay to, to rap about whatever you want and to not have to dress things up in, you know, candy coat, your message just to say things how you really saw them to made it okay to shock people and that's sort of the the message that still resonates today in a lot of hip hop music yeah and and lastly is is Compton California as a city are they proud of you know i mean they they were literally put on the map from from these guys are they proud of that affiliation it, Compton has had a weird relationship with gangster rap and hip hop. There, there have been some mayors who've been really tried to distance themselves from it, and kind of even publicly, this one mayor publicly scolded EVE for what he was doing. But, but now the city has come to terms with it. And I think when Dr. Dre sold his headphones company Beats to Apple for three billion dollars, oh I think that really <laughs> established him as not just you know a, a potty mouth rapper, but a genuine successful businessman. And I think nowadays people are, are really proud of him and the other group members. Well, Ben, uh, it's again, it's Ben Westoff, and the book is Original Gangsters: The Untold Story of Dr. Dre, Easy E, Ice Cube, Tupac Shakur, and the Birth of West Coast Rap. I wish you great success with it, man. Thank you for the time today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ben. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. 